I want to talk around paranoia and the role of trauma within paranoia. It's a real fascination of me around what paranoia is and we have to be very careful. We're falling very much into a world where we're trying to make anxiety into paranoia just to fit CBT. Anxiety is not paranoia. Physiologically there can be similarities but the severity is different. So you cannot work with it in the same way. And people fall in the ideas that you work in the same way with voices as paranoia, you don't. The three stages are polar opposites. So we're going to look at how we take those apart. We want to look at different belief systems. I want to show you what will look like a very, very complex case study. There's a lot of symbolism in there that you have to make sense of. But when you separate it out into the three stages, it starts to make sense. But a lot of people use the word paranoia, don't they? But where does it come from? It's a very interesting word when you take it apart. Does anybody know? It's actually a Greek word. The word paranoia was coined by Hippocrates, who was commonly described as the founder of medicine. He was born around the year 460 BC on the Greek island of Kos. He used the word paranoia to describe people's experiences when they had a very high temperature. He did this by putting together the Greek words para, which means beside, and nous, which means mind, to create out of one's mind. Now, if you look at this again, is very important, is relating it to a high temperature. So what does that tell us about paranoia? It's episodic. It's not on a continuum because we don't have a high temperature all the time. We have to remember paranoia is not always on a continuum. There will be different stages. This is what we do with the Maastricht interview for thoughts, beliefs and paranoia. How many episodes has there been? Who or what influenced each episode? You have to take them apart. It's very important. But we're all living in a very paranoid world, especially in England one of the most watched countries in the world. How many CCTV cameras do you think there are in England? Yeah, yeah you're right, there's millions. Five million. That's 20% of the world's population of CCTV cameras. If you're out in London during the day, you're caught on camera approximately 156 times. You can guarantee if you get mugged, the bleeding thing's not working. You can guarantee that one. <laughs> But I just want to look at some work that uh, Dave Harper did at the University of East London. And also, I'm going to ask you about your beliefs. I'm not going to challenge them, because you can believe what you want. It doesn't make no difference to me. But if you look at our traditional assumptions about paranoia and paranoid delusions, they're seen as an irrational and false belief, belonging to an individual, or more rarely, a couple or group. Now, when we're talking about couples and groups, we're talking about folie deux. A folie deux is a psychiatric myth. A folie deux would be me and... Teresa, here, having exactly 100%, no variance, what would be seen as the same delusional belief. Doesn't happen. There's always a variance. The closest we've ever got in the UK was the Moore's murderers, Brady and Hinley. But it was influence on him over her, so it can't be an accurate folie d'air. There's never been one recorded. But you'll see them use the folie d'air to keep people in psychiatric care. I represented a guy at a tribunal. He'd been ritualistically abused for years. His mother knew, but she didn't have the power to stop it. What they tried to say was, the mother and the son were having a folie d'oeur. The trauma never happened. The abuse never happened. But the sister witnessed it. So I said, well, what is this then? Is this a folie trice? How ridiculous do we get with all this? It seems a sign of pathology, and the content and context of which are meaningless. And the aims of the intervention are to reduce the distress by eliminating the belief in some way, usually through the use of psychiatric medication, and it's supposed to make the person more rational. But there's problems with these assumptions. They're based on a naively realist view of the world. Most people are diagnosed without empirical investigations taking place. You have to be very, very careful. Are we talking with fact or are we talking about delusion? You make an assumption that the belief is not real, you might finish up in the coroner's court very, very quickly. There's an incident in Scotland about 10 years ago, a guy diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, he constantly told his care team his life was in danger. Because of his diagnosis, no one believed him. 3.45, Friday afternoon, he walked into their offices and he said, I am now in grave danger, please find me a place of safety. Look, you're just having a bad time, go home. Well, that night somebody shot him in the head. So you'll be very clear, what are we working with? Agreement between diagnosis is a poor. If you had six consultant psychiatrists in here, they wouldn't all agree on my diagnosis. So who's right and who's wrong? We do not have objective evidence, many beliefs, such as political, political ethical and religious. But conventional theories see delusions as abnormal in some way. But saves every general public show our rates of belief in supposed to be a rational phenomena. 
Now, I'll ask you about your beliefs. I'm not going to challenge them. I just want to see where you fit within the percentage within society. How many people here believe in God? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Who doesn't believe in God? Who uses him when you're in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> it's always a few sits on the fences, yeah. Okay. So, so. Who believes in telepathy? Any telepathists? Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. I remember teaching some student nurses in Liverpool. I said, who believes in telepathy? One guy at the back went, me. I said, how does it work? He said, I've just told you. <laughs> <laughs> so, who believes in hypnotism, hypnotherapy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ghosts? Life after death? Yeah. Faith healing? Yeah. What about ability to predict the future? Yeah. Um, I got a section three for that. <laughs> <laughs> I told the psychiatrist I was Notre Dame, and he locked me up. He says, You never saw that coming, Notre Dame, did you? <laughs> so, who believes in UFOs? Any UFOs? Okay. okay. What about alien abduction? Okay, for any workers here today then, what would you do if you were working with someone and they said, I've been abducted by aliens? How could you help them make sense of that belief? It's a meaning behind it. It's a meaning behind it, yeah. But Google it. You get, you get about 10,000 hits. The only sites that get more hits than alien abduction is porn. So Chris tells me, I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but let them share it with like-minded experience. But it's very important because when we look at alien abduction, it is one of the most sought after things out there. Very, very important because in San Diego, they have alien abduction support groups. Because there's more people being abducted than people haven't, especially in America. Now, interestingly enough, they used to minute the groups and put the minutes on the internet. I used to read them and you'd see a theme. You just put initials for the people. You'd see a theme start to build with the men. And in one of the meetings, they might say, something happened one night. I was driving home in my truck on the dusty road. That's all they tell you. As time goes on. When I was driving along that night, the aliens abducted me. And a bit later on, it'll be, then they performed experiments on me. During these experiments, the aliens used an anal probe. What might they be trying to tell you? Being sexually abused. It's an alien act to them. It's affecting their masculinity. They're not yet ready to tell you what's happened, but they're making you aware that something's up so we can be very sensitive about the biographical account. Because interestingly enough, and this is, I don't think you can believe this one, but never know, Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton swear, that don't mean that, does it? <laughs> when they were presidents of the United States, they were abducted by aliens, they were taken away, had experiments performed on and then brought back. If Bill had stuck Monica's dress, they'd got away with that one, wouldn't they? <laughs> but if you look at the rates in the general public, you've got telepathy 45%, ability to pick the future 45, hypnotism 42, life after death 39, fear feeling 39, ghost 31, alien abduction 70%, but UFOs 35%. So, if you've only got 35% believing in UFOs, how can you have 70% believing in alien abduction? <laughs> so, but if you look at this again, you've got 70%, so you've got a 35% split. 35% of that alien abduction are not talking about little green men taking them away. They're talking about something else, something that's alien to them, and they've been abducted and experiments performed on them. It's their way of making sense of it. Because studies find it hard to differentiate between normal and deluded people. But there's evidence that people vary in their conviction in supposedly delusional beliefs. But delusions are seen as meaningless. There is evidence that delusional beliefs may relate to purpose and meaning in life. Links may be found th between themes in a person's delusions and in their life. Surveys report a link between paranoid beliefs and social positions, characterised by powerlessness and the threat of victimisation and exploitation. We've got to look at what we can learn from history. Let's, let's use England as an example, or, and, and Australia with the Aborigines. What happened to the Irish communities, the Jewish communities, black minority ethnics? What happened to them when they landed on the shores of England? Something very important happened. They were victimised, they were exploited, and they were persecuted. And in some societies it still happens. 
There's a wealth of knowledge on your doorstep that you need to tap into. Talk to the elders of those communities. As a body of people, how did you come together to cope with that victimisation and exploitation and be able to function? It's a wealth of knowledge you can use for people in mental health services that get victimised and exploited. It's there, it's on his doorstep. But it was a lady in Stockport just outside Manchester, she was in the late 60s, long history of psychiatric care. Every time the social worker came to see her, she said, someone's, someone's messing about with my waterworks. That's the taps, not her. But every time we put the tap on, the water was running. It was seen as a fixed, unshakable belief. The social worker had a section and forcibly medicated. It was only by pure chance a befriender from Manchester Mine didn't know that she'd been sectioned. He went to visit her on a Saturday afternoon. He caught the landlord coming out of her apartment. He'd been messing with the water pipes so he can get her in hospital and sell the apartment behind her. So you've got to look at the victimisation and exploitation. It's very, very important. Because as Chris has said before, we talk about sexual, physical, emotional abuse and neglect. But when you're working with paranoia, I will urge you, never neglect, neglect. John talked about the emotional abuse, which is very damaging, but neglect is really difficult when working with someone with paranoia. Uh, I'm not going to use anybody as an example in this room because I don't know your past histories, but let's say there was a young woman here, stood at the front. If I was to sexually or physically abuse her, beyond the power and the control, I'm giving her a very, very powerful message. What's that message, beyond the power and the control? Two things I'm telling her. One is, I can see her. The second one is, I'm interested in her. Whether that's a good or a bad way, I'm showing an interest in another human being. What does neglect say? No one's interested. That is devastating for human beings because we are sociable animals. You see it for children. They get neglected, no one sees them, so they create a world around them. The problem is, as they get older, that world gets bigger and more difficult to control. You'll see people, MI5 are following me, KGB, CIA. Now, we can't understand their terror, because we have to remember they are billion pound organisations that can take you out of there at any time. I worked with a guy in America, that's who were following him. He walked into his hotel to see me. Did you see him, Pete? Riding me like petrol pumps. This is how frightened this guy was. And I said, listen, Tom, I can't understand your terror, because it's yours. But give me 10 seconds. I know this is going to be very difficult for you. Because he's a billion pound organisation, you could disappear and no one would ever know. If there was no terror at all, billion pound organisations interested in you, how would you feel? No terror. Special. Okay. Tell me parts of your life when you've never felt special. As I grew up, he says, I'm an author. He says, my dad was a hotshot lawyer in Las Vegas. And uh, he wanted me to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be a lawyer. My mum left, left me with him on a Tuesday or Saturday, and he whipped me every day to convince me to be a lawyer. And his mum ignored that it happened. So he's invisible. So he creates a world, these people are interested in him, but then they're too powerful and he can't control them. So when you look at the invisibility with people in psychiatric care, it's really, really difficult for them to get that control back once it's gone. But it's about, I want to be seen. But don't think the neglect is about poverty. You'll see a lot of people now coming into psychiatric care, privilege neglect. Got everything, but never told they loved. This is what John was talking about, the emotional abuse. Last year I went to see a young lady. Her dad's a big director at British Petroleum, and her mum's got her own advertising company. When their daughter was 12, they put her in private school. They didn't see her again until she was 18. Six years. I walked into their front room, and the daughter sat there. She's self-arming, she's covered in tattoos, and she's covered in piercings. What's she saying? <laughs> See me. And I said to the dad, could you tell your daughter that you love her? She knows. I said, no, I didn't ask you that question. Tell your daughter that you love her. She knows. I said, please, don't repeat yourself, because it gets on my nerves. Please tell your daughter that you love her. Well, you know, she was 14, Peter, I bought her a pony. Well, fuck the pony. I'm not interested in the pony. Tell your daughter that you love her. She passed the driving test, she got a sports car. He couldn't do it. And I asked the mother and neither could she. I was there for one hour, at the end of the hour he said to me, please leave and don't come back. <laughs> a week later, she left. She lives in Bristol on her own. She says, but now I'm developing friends that can see me. 
my parents never saw me. So it's about privilege neglect as well. So, but the neglect is quite devastating when we look at the invisibility. Because when we look at the Warner McAndrew study, most staff do not discuss traumatic incidents, including abuse, with service users in the assessment process. Most service users would prefer to talk to a nurse rather than a doctor about traumatic incidences. It's less intimidating. They want nurses to initiate the discussion. Now, I don't believe this is just nurses. It's anybody that's going to ask, but you've got to act. If you're not going to act, don't ask. You've got a case of classic re-traumatisation. If you've got a girl at six that says... Mom, my stepfather does things to me and it hurts. And she says, he wouldn't do that, don't be silly. It becomes a six-year-old's fault. She's now 36 and you ask, or they take a chance and disclose to you, can I tell you something? And they're in psychiatric care. When I was six, my stepfather used to have sexual intercourse with me. If you just say, oh, thanks for telling me. Oh, must be my fault. Classic re-traumatisation. I've told twice, nobody's done anything. But why have they chosen you to tell? Is a specific reason. And you can't assume this, you've got to earn it. Trust. They trust you. And if they've told you, you've got that trust, or they won't tell you. Now, hold that trust. Don't let it go. It's very important. I work with a lot of female survivors of abuse and incest. And when I get disclosures, my first response to them is, have you told anybody about this before? If a trauma history's been taken, you do not have to retake it. They might say, no, I haven't. So I say, well, I feel very privileged you've chosen me to tell. Would you like me to do anything with it? They might say, no, Pete, but do you believe me? And that will be enough, the validation. Or they might say, yes, I do want you to do something with it. Now, I appreciate I don't know what your positions are. You might be in a position where you think this is not something I work with. That's OK. Just go back to the trust and say, I feel very privileged you've chosen me to tell. It's not something I work with, but I don't want to leave you with this. Will you allow me to bring an external body like rape crisis, but I'll support you while you go through the process? You get someone to that point, it's very important if they want to do something, we support them on to the next stage. We talk about why not, we talk about the medical model, I think that's been covered this morning. The client is too disturbed, that's just avoidance. Creation is too much stress, distress, the can of worms. I'm going to come back to this because I said previously, a can of worms is a can of worms, whether it's closed or it's open. Because if it opens and you're not ready, then it will cause you distress. And the clients don't want to talk about it, that's just rationalisation. Because one of the problems we've got in the context of psychiatry is this. People focus on this. You focus on the behaviour, you will never, ever understand the person. You've got to look at the thoughts and the feelings that create that behaviour. Otherwise, it won't make sense. There has to be consequences for behaviour, but why someone behaves, we need to know. So if we look at this as the three stages of paranoia, and we're going to look at how it's polar opposites, because with hearing voices, you have the startling phase, the organisational phase, and the stabilisation phase. You want to be in the third stage. With this, you don't want to be in the third stage. So we'll look at the thoughts, the triggers. The feelings, remember there's a threat in there, the conspiracy, and the behaviour is the conviction. Now, CBT purists will always say we have a thought before we have a feeling. Nonsense. You can have a feeling before you have a thought. Mm. You ever woke up feeling anxious? Mm -hmm. And then you think, why am I feeling anxious? And then you remember. Something you've got to do. So the feelings have come first. So it can, it can go both ways. So I'll give you a, an example of how quickly this could spiral for someone. We've got the trigger, the thoughts. Someone might say, they've just looked at me in a strange way. Are they sniggering at me? So it might be something that's seen as being quite innocuous. The conspiracy is the feelings. I don't feel safe in this situation. I'm getting very anxious. I want to get away. They're definitely plotting something. So the social withdrawal starts. And the conviction is the behaviour. I'm going to hide away. I don't feel safe around people. So they go home. They lock the door. They draw the curtains. They unplug the telephone. Now remember, keeping up the social functioning with paranoia is paramount. But within the context of this situation, which is the above is the main problem? Trigger conspiracy or conviction? Which would be the main problem? What do you think? Yeah, you're talking around, you're talking around, you're talking about the, the thoughts and the feelings, but a lot of people focus upon this because the person might be socially isolated, they might not be letting you in. It can be difficult to work with, but if you understand what's behind that behaviour, it starts to make sense. So, look at this as an example. If someone's in the conviction stage, what's the story? What's happening now? Listen to their beliefs. Doesn't matter how elaborate that story is, 
There's an element of truth in there somewhere. And then the conspiracies, the history. Like we said before, how have you got here? What's brought you into psychiatric care? If you've got the narrative, it's very difficult to work with anybody's experience unless you have got a comprehensive narrative. Because the voices, the paranoia, the beliefs don't make any sense because there's nothing to relate it to. And then the trigger is the past and the present. You determine the relationship between past events and present experiences. If you understand this, when someone's in the conviction stage, you can find the elements and truth in it which we need to start to work with the person. So what I want to do is, we haven't got time, usually I'd have let you work this out, but we haven't got time. This is a, what will be seen as a very, very complex case study. But when you break it down into the three stages, it makes sense because people will gush, people will tell you all this information. And when you've, if you have it all in front of you, you just don't know where to start. So we have to take it apart. I also worked with a very radical psychologist called Terry McLaughlin. He was the only psychologist I ever knew that sacrificed his job for his values. And we just get some complex people to work with. Now, this was a young lady called Angie. I'll give an overview and then I'll give you the background. She's been in psychiatric care for years. She'd been on large doses of antipsychotic medication. At the first meeting that I met her with Terry, she said, I'm going to go cold turkey off all my medication. Now, we begged her not to, please don't do that. But she did it anyway. Now, to work this out, jot this down because this is very important. In her own words, she said, the dam was open. They're very, very significant words. She walked into the local police station and she said, I'd like you to arrest me. I'm a paedophile. I abuse children and I video it. So now you've got some serious shit you're starting to deal with here. She's convinced that this man comes to her flat at 10 o'clock every Friday morning. He knocks on the door. She opens the door. She's not allowed to see his face. He comes in. He changes around cameras he's installed to monitor her with. We can never find these cameras. He takes her into the front room. He strips her naked. He has sex with her. He sprays shaving foam inside her. Then he urinates on the carpet. Urine, you'll find, is a big theme in here. She had a very supportive boyfriend, but she started to systematically take up all of support networks. She got up in the middle of the night, she took the panel off the side of the bath. She laid on the floor and she started to roll about on the floor. The boyfriend came out of the bedroom and he was naked. And he said to her, what are you doing? She says, I don't abuse children anymore. I murder them and I'm storing them under the bath. He looked under the bath, there was nothing there. And he says, why are you rolling about on the floor? She says, I'm bathing in their blood to celebrate their demise. She then accused him of having eight penises. She says, you've been having sex with me with an alien. She's a very strong girl. She picked him up and she threw him out of the flat onto the landing naked. At that point, he says, I've had enough. And he walked away. So she's systematically taking everything. So I'll give you the background and then we'll look at the clue. Ages are very significant in this as well. Angie and her sister were brought up by their mother who was a heroin addict. At times when their mother wasn't able to inject herself, Angie would have to do it for her. When she was seven years old, the mother died of a heroin overdose. Angie was never sure whether she administered the fatal dose. Their grandfather gained custody of them and began to abuse them. As he abused her sister, he would make Angie itter at the same time. He would tell her he was a hypnotist and would put a bar in her head so she wouldn't remember the abuse. After he's into the abuse, he would urinate upon her. Now he's doing something very significant here. What is he doing by urinating upon her? He is, yeah, he's pissing up, but what, but what else? What is, what is that behaviour? You're spot on, my friend, it's animalistic, isn't it? So that smell, I'll always know you where you are and I'll always be able to control you. As she approached 14 years of age, her behaviour became very aggressive, just placed in school for dysfunctional children. Whilst in there, she was given large doses of antipsychotic medication, which she continued to take for many years. When she was 21 years old, she got into an abusive relationship where her boyfriend would play mind games with her and frighten her. When the relationship broke up, he told her she'd never be free of him. For many years, she became increasingly frightened and paranoid, was admitted to psychiatric services at the age of 26, where she received a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. She had long spells in hospital. Whenever she tried to talk about her experience, she was disbelieved and told it was part of her illness. At the age of 33, she went cold turkey off all her medication and handed herself in to the police telling them she'd been abusing children. She 
became convinced that a man would enter a flat every Friday, because not allowed to see his face. We'd change around cameras installed to monitor with, strip her naked, have sex with her, and spray shaving foam inside her. We then urinate on the carpet. She became very fearful of police and psychiatric services, refusing to engage with them as they were part of the conspiracy, but the police took no action over the child abuse charges. Now, one of the things I need to be very clear about this is, when we're working with belief systems, quite often we make the belief system secondary, we don't take it apart or take it away, because it's something that in there that person finds positive. But in this we could find nothing positive, it was all being very negative upon Angie's life. So if we break this down into the three stages, why do you think she was convinced she was an abuser? What could be in that narrative? She had to give the mother heroin. She had to hit her sister. She's been made compliant. It's a life trap. This is what abusers do. They make you compliant, like with me. 13-year-old boy, primary abusers, female. What's going to happen to my body upon touch? I'm going to get an erection. That makes me compliant. If you don't get an erection, I can't have sex with you. You're the dirty bastard. You want it, you enjoy it. Everybody will know it's your fault. It all becomes part of the conspiracy about society is going to blame me. And it was quite interesting, because urine has a strong theme in this. Occasionally, I would go out with her for a drink, and we might be sat in a bar. Might be in there an hour, and then she might go... Pete, can you smell piss? That's not a trigger. That's something else. I'll explain what that is. But what might you do if you're sat in a bar? This is your friend. What might you do before we start to pathologise? What might we rationalise? I oh, was sat near the gents. I'm sure the ladies smell very nice. I've never been in them, but the gents stink at times. So we're looking to check. Let's check it out. Or also, what's been happening for this lady in the past few weeks? And at times, she would feel frightened and powerless. What action could you take at this point? You're trying to get her to name people she will identify in a crisis. She's building her support networks. By doing that, she's letting people into her life, which is very difficult for her. But this was a big one. She convinced this man enters the flat every Friday. How could you help her make sense of this belief? Now, what we've got to be very careful here is, we don't know if this guy's coming. We've got an idea there isn't. You could be there at 10 o'clock, and then you could leave at 12. But they move the goalpost very quickly. I saw you leave, Pete, and he came at half past 12 moving very very quickly also it could be that the fear is that entrenched she doesn't want to see the faces sometimes people black out black out the faces so we have to be very very careful on this i'll get, tell you what terry did for this lady because it was very creative so one of the trigger with the with the alarm system ask what's been happening in the last few weeks Take action, seek support and advice if necessary. Be trying to see the relationship between the past events. This is why we need a comprehensive narrative. When did this abuse start? When did it end? Were there any times when it wasn't, when it wasn't as bad? You've got to have this information. Because actually, it started in January. Well, that's quite interesting. We have these experiences more in January. Because you were only younger. As it got older, got more severe. But we've got a starting point. You need to understand what, why she might be asking these questions. And again, prepare for at this stage. Be asking to identify people she can trust in a crisis. Check out the reality of fears and feelings, but importantly, ask why she's not been arrested if she is a child abuser. We're not telling her it's wrong. All you do is trying to raise that element of that. Why have the police not took no action? Maybe there's more to this than what we think. But this was an interesting one. What you've probably seen people at work with people, quite often you can tell that person who's engaging and who isn't engaging. Now, Angie was very engaged, but we were going to her flat. And this is something Terry came up with, and he just said to her, hey, She's really engaging, let's use that engagement. He says to her, hey Angie, part of your recovery is you're, gonna, you're coming to see us, not coming to you, us to see you, what do you think? She goes, well, that's not a problem. She says, we're about half past nine Friday morning, come to our offices. This guy comes at ten. So she's there, half past nine. So she can easily say, when I got home, he saw me go out, he came then. We've got to do something. And I, I didn't know what Terry was going to do. We're chatting informally while quarter to ten. And then he says, do you want a coffee, Angie, before we start? Yeah, okay, he went, come with me, Pete, I want to run an idea by you. We went out of the office, but Terry went straight back in, and he just said, do me a favour, will you, Angie? Somebody comes looking for us, tell them we're busy. He went, yeah, okay. He went out, he closed the door. He says, don't go anywhere, wait here. And he left us sat there on her own for 15 minutes. He just counted down on his watch. Now, it's Friday, it's approaching 10 o'clock, but it's a different venue. So it got to 10 o'clock and he hit that door harder than I've ever, ever seen anybody hit a door. And if I come and knock on your door this evening, before you tell me to go away or invite me in, you've got to do something very significant. What would it be? When you've opened the door, what have you got to do? So I say, come in, Pete, I'll start off, I've seen enough of you today. 
You've got to do you've got to identify the person, haven't you? Mm -hmm. You don't know who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. She opened the door and she looked Terry straight in the eyes. And he went, Ten o'clock Friday morning, why have you just identified me? That was a light bulb moment. We didn't get to that point at first, but what it showed us, we've missed something. We have to go back. We haven't gained enough trust for her to tell her, for her to tell us. So we start again. What it was, by putting time and effort in, the grandfather gained custody of him 10 o'clock Friday morning. That's what she didn't want to see. That was what she didn't want to see. But interesting, what was the bar that the grandfather put in her head? If we just go back here, something happened to her when she was 14. What was that bar? And what did we do? What did we beg her not to do? I'm going to put a bar in your head so you won't remember anything. What became symbolic of the bar? Antipsychotic medication. She ran it from the age of 14. She couldn't remember the abuse. What did we beg her not to do? Go cold turkey. So at that point, she goes cold turkey. People might say she has a flashback. No, she did not. She had a flash surfacing. Bang. She's back in that moment. All she can see is a young girl with another girl, which is her sister, being abused and videoed. She's back in that moment. What she does know is it's wrong. So she hands herself into the police. Try and make sense of it. But what about the shaving foam? What does that symbolise? Could be cause of, could be that kind of thing, yeah. But at age. Age is a very significant in this, 7, 14, 21. Puberty. Paedophiles don't like puberty. They used to shave her and her sister to make them look younger so they could continue with the abuse. So although the symbolism looks crazy in the context of the narrative, it starts to make sense when we've got the, the history behind it. Because when we talk about alarm systems, we focus too much upon triggers, especially in paranoia. Now, alarm systems are related to circumstances that become the trigger. For example, smelling urine. Now, when we talk about this, when you have, an, you have the alarm system, and then it will trigger the thoughts. When she can smell urine, it triggers the thoughts. What's the content of those thoughts, do you think? Little girl being abused and pissed all over. That's when it becomes problematic. So when she smells urine, you've got to take action. So you don't get the thoughts triggered, which creates the disempowerment. So don't focus on the triggers, you focus on the alarm system that precedes the trigger. Because what we have to remember is, irrational thoughts are what we first react to, but the thoughts are rational when that initial threat occurs. We focus too much on irrational thoughts, but there's a rationality behind the rational thought. Because trauma goes away, but thoughts and memory remain. Fearful situations stay in the brain and they're very, very easily activated. Now, a negative response would be people saying your thoughts are not real. A positive response would be, when your thoughts and beliefs more real? When did they start? Nine years ago. What was happening nine years ago? And as Carl Rogers said years ago, the relationship is more important than the therapy, and that is so important. I've been assessing CBT students for over 10 years at Manchester University. They go in a room, interview one of our colleagues, and we watch them on video, and some very, very good ones, don't get me wrong. But some of them make a fundamental error. They come out and say, you've made a mistake. What is that mistake? I haven't. OK, let's reflect again. You started with the agenda. How did you finish up? I set the homework. You've made a mistake with homework. What is it? Now we've got to set homework, Pete. Yeah, I no, appreciate that. But what did you not do? Can't see it. You never bothered to ask your client whether they can read or write. You made an assumption. So if you set them homework and they can't read or write, the chances are they will disengage from that therapy. Then who gets the blame? They do. If someone doesn't engage with us, we've got to start to look at ourselves. What is it about me that this person does not want to engage with me? So the relationship is more important than the therapy. Because if we continue to focus on the behaviour, all we've got is a vicious circle. We go round and round, but the threat stays in the middle. So if we look at breaking the cycle of threat, quite often when people start to get paranoid, they get an increased arousal and they become hypervigilant. Now, some people are hypervigilant throughout the year. I know I am, I call myself a scanner. But some people, it changes with the months, dark mornings, dark nights. I'll give you an example, it's a few years ago. I was going to work in London. This is how quickly it can cycle through the three stages. I left home at 5.30 in the morning. It's dark and it's damp. I walk down the steps from where I live and I see a man walking down the road. I've seen him. Guarding myself against danger, you call that healthy paranoia. It takes me 30 minutes to walk to the train station, and he followed me. Never once tried to walk past me, then he followed me into the train station. So you think, all right, okay, coincidence. 
But then he stood really close on my shoulder and he watched me buy a ticket for London. Then he bought one. And he sat opposite me on the train and he never spoke. So you can think, okay, it's still coincidence. I get off at St Pancras, I jump on the tube and he jumped on and he stood behind me. Now we're into a conspiracy. What's going off here? I got off, I got off at Holborn High Street and he followed me down Holborn High Street. So I think, what's this bastard doing following me? I stop outside this training room, he walked past and he smiled, but I'm perceiving it as a smirk. Now there's two ways I can go with this. One is I can try and rationalise it. Apart from my wife and Jackie Dillon, who I was working with, nobody knew I was going to London. How would somebody to know what to walk down the street at 5.30 in the morning? Would a lay person pay £256 for a ticket on the day? No. But if I've not dealt with my shit, I can twist that. No, he wouldn't, but someone in authority might. Someone in authority might follow me down to London. Where's that fear of authority come from? Being sexually, physically, emotionally abused by a babysitter and her two friends or people in authority. Trauma goes, thoughts and memory remain, and they're very, very easily activated. Now, if we don't make sense of that, it becomes an emotional overload. Then what the person often does, they start to socially withdraw. Now, that acts as a retreat and protection. What they might do is they may go home, isolate themselves in the bedroom. Now at this point, responses from family members and workers is very, very important. Because if that person is just perceived as lazy and they put under excessive pressure, come on, we need to get out of here and do something. You can't stay in your room all day. But you don't know what that belief system's about. And that belief system is if I step out that front door, somebody's going to shoot me in the head. You'll become part of that conspiracy very, very quickly. If you're the person that says you love me, or the worker that says you want to help, why are you trying to put me in a place of danger? You become part of it very, very quickly. So the person, the social withdrawal will continue to be a retreat and protection. Now when we look at breaking the cycle of threat, when you're working with people that experience as paranoia or fears, have clear, supportive, positive communication. Be very concise in what you say. A trip of a word, and they might build it into something you didn't mean. Help them try and make sense of ideas and beliefs, because it means something to them. We have to understand it. Now don't collude, because you'll get drawn into something you don't understand. I work with a lot of people and I don't understand their beliefs and I'm honest with them. I'll say, I don't share your beliefs, but what do they mean to you? It's what we call the fit. It's how they're making sense of a confusing reality. I'm not saying that they're wrong, I'm just saying I don't understand them, explain them to me. I'll give you an example, there's a friend of mine, he's called Peter, a few years ago he got sectioned under the Mental Health Act. There were no beds in Sheffield, so they outlaid him in Harrogate and he's a fantastic escapologist. 48 hours and he's on the run. So they captured him and they brought him back to Sheffield. And I, I know his consultant quite well. And he rang me and says, Pete, I've got your mate here, will they come and see him? So I get there and you know what it's like, the room is full. And uh, other Peter sat there and he says, hey Pete, did you hear I escaped in Arrogate? I says, yeah, I've heard. So when I was walking through the town centre of Arrogate, I saw the Queen of England driving along in a little mini. <laughs> and he got a Union Jack wing mirror cover on. So I stole it. So she's got out complaining. I've had a right row with Queen in Arrogate. You can see them all shaking their heads. And this guy's lost his coat. He says to me, I'll tell you what you don't know though, Pete. He says, I found the Holy Grail. I am the only living person that knows where the Holy Grail is. So I've put my coat over it. So when the second person gets there, they know I were there first. What do you think to that then? Before I can say anything, this psychiatrist says, I'll tell you, your friend's very unwell. I says, no, he's not. He says, you don't know why he's here. He says, because he's unwell. Another one fucking repeats himself. I said, no, I heard you the first time. I say, start talking psychosis, you're talking semantics, you don't know why he's here. Let me explain to you. In the last 12 months, including both his mum and his dad, five members of his family have committed suicide or died. His wife's thrown him out, he's lost his home, his children and his job. This is all about loss. In this world, he's got no control. In this world, he has. He can argue with the Queen, he knows where the Holy Grail is. You can't tell him he's wrong because you don't know where it is. I've got some control back within my life. What this guy needs in his very intense bereavement counselling, because it's not all about death, it's a lot of our, it's loss of identity, being a father, being a provider. He's a very proud man. And I've got to give respect to this psychiatrist. He got it him. Very, very intense bereavement counselling. Three weeks later, this guy was at our Christmas meal. He wasn't right, but he was dipping his toe back into this world. But he knows if things get rough, he's got a world he can retreat into which keeps him safe. So we don't always take that belief away, we make it secondary so the person can function while they hold that belief and then we can start to break the cycle of threat. 
But when we, when we look at why we need a construct, which is what Chris was talking about, if you were going to look at, that, look at a construct for Angie, you'd have to identify how many boxes there were to put things in, like Chris was talking with that little boy in that box. So I'll give you an example of how, how we need to understand a person's life history. We've got, we've got a situation here, and this is what we pull out from the Maastricht interview. We've got a little boy there, say he's four years of age. Now, is, is anybody in this room called Bob? Any Bobs? I'm asking for a reason, because I don't like to use the name of someone that's in the room, okay? So we'll call him Bob. I asked that question in Thessaloniki. You don't get many Bobs in Greece, do you? Like, you know? <laughs> we had a Papa Lazarus, it liked being a League of Gentlemen, it was great. <laughs> so next to a neighbour's called Bob, and uh, he's an amiable guy. Chats a little boy, and he chats to his mum and dad. Little boy's in the garden one day, and he says, uh, Come here, young'un, I'll ask you something. What, Bob? So, How come your parents never go out? Why, why do they never go out? I never see them go out anywhere. No babysitter, Bob. Nobody to look after me. Oh, okay, just wondered. That's all he wants to know, so he leaves it at that. He leaves it a few more weeks, and he sees the parents gardening. Gets chatting to him, he says, I've noticed you two never go out, why is that? He already knows. Well, nobody to look after the little one. All oh, right. I said, well, if, if you ever do want a night out, I don't mind babysitting. I'm not a drinker. I get on really well with him, you know. Oh, that's interesting. It's our wedding anniversary next week. It'd be nice to have a nice heart. Nice guy, that Bob, isn't he? As Bob babysits, this becomes a bit more routine each week. Fine, everything's fine. Goes on for about three months. Little boy's in the garden one day again playing. Young one, come here. He says, where's your cat? Not seen your cat for weeks. Don't know, Bob. I think it's run away. Hasn't. Hasn't it? See that mound of earth down there? I've killed it and I've fucking buried it. You tell me and I'll fucking bury you. What's he just done? What's he instilled in him? Fear. We said before, fear is the most powerful emotion we've got. So he's got him now. He can start to do anything. Like Chris was saying, anger is a second powerful emotion, not, not aggression. Sometimes when you ask these people, questions, pe these que people these questions, they will get angry. Don't make an assumption that they're angry at you. If someone's been abused by a third party, they're not angry at the third party. They're angry at the parental role for allowing it to happen. That's different from blame. It's not about blame, it's about anger. So he's got him now so he can start to do anything he wants. There's only two things he can do. One is he dissociates to get out of there. The second one, he puts that fear in that box. He closes that lid, never to go there again. That's when he goes into denial. If I dare not look, I cannot see. If I cannot see, I cannot think. That trauma is in a freeze frame. It hasn't stopped for him. He's waiting for it to happen again. But emotionally, he will stay at four. Now, when we talk about don't open a can of worms, we have to open a can of worms because a can of worms is a can of worms whether it's closed or it's open. It will open itself eventually. If those terrors jump out, you've got some real problems. What you've got to be prepared to do is you've got to give him the appropriate support to open that box and see it as an adult, not as a child. When he sees it as an adult, the fear is irrational. It's out of date. Why do people use drinking drugs? They use drinking drugs to remove mental pain. What you've got to understand is the mental pain is out of date. You're an adult, you're not a child. Very important, do not parent adults. Parenting kids keeps kids alive. Parenting adults keeps adults insane. We get to a situation where they think they need their parents. We do not. As we are born, we are 100% dependent on our parents for survival. If you don't feed us, water us, clothe us, we will die. As, ad as adults, we are interdependent. We don't need our parents. We think we do if we're stuck emotionally. It's nice to have them around with the nice people. My parents died years ago. I'm still here. It's a dependency that we don't need. But this is why we need a full construct. There might not be one box. We've got four here. There could be 20. Apart from terrifying him about he's going to bury him like the cat, he needs to keep him more quiet as he gets older. What else might he say to him? What might happen if he tells? Yeah, he'll tell fucking bad things like that, I'm warning you. So this goes on for another couple of years, he thinks, little boy thinks, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Just can't do it, I've got to tell someone. But he said bad things will happen. I know what I'll do. I'll tell my dog. Dog will not grasp me up. So he tells his dog. Two days later, he comes out the garden, but he forgot to close the gate. Dog runs out, gets hit by a car and killed. So he's lost his cherished pet 
But what's in there? What emotion's in there? Guilt. Guilt. Very, very powerful emotion. It will drive paranoia and it will drive voices. Okay, so Bob's been proved right, hasn't he? I told you not to tell. It's your fault. So he thinks, Christ almighty, Bob's right. What if I accidentally tell one of my friends at school? What, uh, what if something bad happens to them? Best thing to do is not have any friends. That's the best thing to do. So he becomes a loner at school. What happens to loners at school? They get bullied. We've got another one now. This goes on until he's eight. He's only got one set of grandparents. They've always worked abroad, but they've become quite wealthy. And they've retired early. So they come home to the UK. Can we have him at the weekends? Be nice to get to know him again. What a result. No more Bob. Because to stop with grandparents, Grandad takes him fishing every Saturday morning. He loves it. They go fishing one Saturday morning. It's been raining. Bank's a bit slippy. Grandad slips down the bank and drowns in the river in front of him. So now he's got another one. He's lost his favourite grandparent. What you've got to be prepared to do is you've got to work through all these. Now, that's the landmine. Because when that happens, it stops being a box. It's a landmine and it's here. It does not go away. So in later life, it could be a comment, a sound, a smell. Something on the media, something on the television. It's going to touch that landmine. Something you say. And they will regress to being a child. When you're talking about their narrative or events in their life, look for a change in their body language. And just say emotionally at this time, how old do you feel? And you'll get, I'm seven, I'm nine, I'm 12. They go back to the age of the, the experience. So what people will often do as well is, because we don't know where we're going to start, we know that's a landmine, they're not going to go there, but they will avoid. You know when someone goes fishing and they put a worm on a hook, what does it do? It wriggles, doesn't it? That's what people do. Oh, no, no, I'm not bothered what, pe what Bob did, Pete. It was so my granddad drowned. Now, trying to take it away from it. What you've got to do is you've got to work on what the one that they will talk about. We might start with the dog, the pet. Now, you've got to try and sweep these boxes clean. You might not get them all clean, but you get enough shit out of them so they can move on to the next one. Now, you might get to the point where he never deals with this, but you've got enough out to enhance his quality of life. But what if you get a situation where, and I'll give an example of the wriggling. I was working with a, a guy in Brisbane a few years ago called Dan. 32 years of age, he has had every addiction you can think of. You'd have to invent another one for him to have another one. But what are addictions about? Avoidance. Mm -hmm. Avoiding the real problem. He will talk about anyone, but he will not talk about his dad. And I asked his mum one day, and I just said, you know what, why won't he talk about his dad? Well, when Dan was seven, my man is now 32, driving through the centre of Brisbane with dad, somebody ran into the back of them. So Dad got out, obviously, see what's happened. The guy from behind is from Australian Special Forces. Now, I don't know why, this, why he's done this. He's punched dad, uh, Dan's dad once in front of Dan and killed him with one punch when he was seven. Now, his mum's lovely. What she did next, she, didn't, she never did with malice, but what she did was absolutely stupid. She said to Dan when he was seven, your dad's gone to Jesus, he'll be back later, and he never went to the funeral. He's been waiting 25 years for Dad to come home. So what's he going to think? What might he think why Dad's not come back? It's my fault, he's angry at me, he doesn't love me. I can't deal with it because emotionally I'm only seven. So I'm going to drink, I'll do drugs, I'll gamble, I'll sleep with anybody I can, anybody, anything to avoid. Like I said before, you've got to remember Danny's not seven, he's 32 years of age. Don't treat him like a seven-year-old. I was sat with him one day and I'll never forget this one hour I had with him. And I said to him, Dan, I'm going to be really honest with you, mate. Stop waiting for your dad because he's dead. He ain't coming back, mate. And he dropped his head on my shoulder and he must have cried for nearly 60 minutes. My shirt was soaking, but I'll never forget his words. He looked up to me at the end and he went, thank fuck for that, I can move on. You've got to set him free. He's not seven years, don't treat him like a seven because emotionally he's 32, it's very, very important. But what if you get a situation where this little boy is now 24 and he finds out that Bob's been dead for 10 years. The abuser controls you with a fear, sometimes from beyond the grave or if they're not in your life. How do you change that? And I'm going to lower back to what Chris was talking about, the trauma triad. Uh, there's a lady that works, works for me now called Hannah. She's one of my clients. I want you to build a mental picture of Hannah, who you're going to work with, because it's very important. I got this referral letter from her psychiatrist, and Hannah didn't live in Sheffield. I'd like you to see this lady. She's got paranoid schizophrenia. 
she's got learning disabilities, and she's only got 5% intelligence. So you think, fuck me, when am I going to start with this? So I decided to go and see her on a Saturday morning. I'm sat on train looking at this letter, think, I don't really think I can do anything here. And they live at this big converted barn. And I, I walk in the kitchen, and these two ladies sat at the table, and I'm thinking, oh, she's obviously not here, because I've already built up a mental image of who I'm going to see. She gets up, she walks across. Hiya, I'm Anna, and she shakes my hand. I'm thinking, oh, OK. So I chatted with her for about an hour, and I thought, well, I believe she hears voices. She, the voice has created her paranoia as well, a lot of paranoia. I thought, I believe she hears voices. She can't have got paranoid schizophrenics. It doesn't exist. We'll get rid of that one. I thought, she's got learning difficulties, not disabilities. There's a vast difference. I thought, she's not only got 5% intelligence. I think the psychologist who did the assessment's got 5% intelligence. <laughs> That's my honest opinion. Now, before you can actually start to do any work with Anna, this is difficult. You've got to have an explanation of her mother, why she let her down when she was 14. Because the reason she let her down was, when Anna was 14 years of age, she was raped by a family friend twice. And on both occasions, she told her mom and dad, and they said, forget it and move on, we don't want the police involved. Dad's dead, mom's alive, mom's got a responsibility, she should have kept her safe. So I asked the question, can you tell your daughter why you let her down when she was 14? Honestly, the silence was deafening. But eventually, she gave Anna an explanation. I wouldn't have accepted it, but Anna did. The interesting thing, because she had three voices. One was a female voice, one was a voice of the rapist, and one was more of a voice of a sister called Holly that commented on her appearance. The female voice became less controlling. You think, oh, if this is linked to mum. So I sat with her one day and I says, Anna, does your mum stop, stop you doing things that you like? She says, yeah. Said, what like? So if I see some clothes I like, I can't have them. My mum won't let me buy them. Be 31, tell your mother to piss off. <laughs> <laughs> but she can't, because emotionally she's only 14. So Anna and myself, we went into the town centre, and we went to this clothes shop, I found the most hideous dress you've ever seen in your life. I said, Anna, I'd like you to buy that dress. I don't like it, I thought, neither do I. I said, but I want you to come and buy it with mum. Pete, I don't like it. I said, I know, I agree with you, but when you come with mum, what will she say? She said, I can't have it. I said, but you know if you still buy it, and your mum says you can't, but you still buy it, and you take it home and it looks a mess, what will you do? I'll take it back. There you go, you're thinking like an adult, not a child. She went with mum, mum says, you're not having that. She said, I am, she bought it, she took it home, it looked fucking horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> but she took it back, you're starting to think, she's thinking like an adult. Now the next thing is you've got to have what we call truth, trust and consent, like Chris was saying. The truth is what is really out there. Is this an adult fear or is it a child's fear? Now the trust is the antidote. If fear is a pathogen that drives all this, Gaining someone's trust is the antidote to that fear. But the consent empowers you, never coerce people. When they consent, they're empowering themselves to take control. What I said to her was, what I'd like you to do, Anna, I'd like you to allow me to bring the rapist into your front room. And at that point, she panics. I said, look, I don't mean physically, I mean through visualisation. You find we're working with traumatic experiences, voices, the guest adult stuff is becoming very popular. She says, oh, I don't know, Pete. So I left it a couple of weeks, and I asked her again, she says, Will you keep me safe? I says, Anna, I promise you, I'll keep you safe. She says, OK, then. So I'm sat on a chair and I pulled up another chair. I says, give me a full description of this rapist in this chair. She give me a full description. And I grabbed him, got him. So I promise you, Anna, I'm not going to let him go. She says, but emotionally, how old do you feel now? 14. You can't do it with a 14. You've got to get her back to 31. So I said, well, Anna, think in your mind. Where would you put a 14-year-old girl to keep her safe? anywhere you want. Now, not always, quite often when you do this with young women, they'll pick a bedroom. Don't put them on the bed. Bad things happen to kids on beds. Put them on the floor. If they have a body flashback, they've got the ground under the floor that they can feel below them. Then ask them to name things they will bring in this room. You'd be amazed what they will bring in to create safety. I said, right, Anna, we've got a lock here. Let's lock that door. This lock, we've got the key, she's safe. The problem is when Anna goes up there, she dissociates. When she dissociates, she loses her senses. Primary senses are colours. Get them to name six red and six blue things in the room. So what you do with post-traumatic stress? You bring them back to the age of where they are now. I said, right, Anna, how old do you feel now? She said, I'm 31. I said, right, what I want you to do, that's what Chris was looking at earlier, I want you to repeat after me, and I want you to say to this rapist, what you did was wrong, I'm angry at you for doing it, and I'm going to stop you doing it again. I want you to repeat it between six and 12 times. 
It's interesting, it got to the eighth time, she stood up. I've got him, he's sat down. The power difference in the room has changed. She's looking down on him before it was the other way. When she got to the eighth time, what you did was wrong. I'm angry if you're doing it, I'm going to stop you doing it again. I left her house at 2.30 in the afternoon. That voice had gone. It came back six months later. I gave her a job working with me doing the Maastricht interview, and it is very, very intense interviewing on, on us. You, you'd ask us questions you'd never think to ask anyone. And we spent six months in London, thought we could revolutionise London, we failed. <laughs> we were coming home on Friday night, and I could see she was really distracted. And I asked her if she was OK, and she says, no. The rapist voice is back. Now, I know if the rapist's in her life, her paranoia is going to soar. So I said, OK, let's not see this as a negative. How do you like this work? She says, Pete, I love it, but it's too much. I can't work at this intensity. I said, how's that made you feel? Like I've got no control. So this voice is now an early warning sign. You need to get control back within your life. So I want you to take a month off work. I'm going to pay you. Just chill out. She took a month off work. The voice went away. You keep the voice at bay, you don't get the paranoia. The interesting thing, apparently this is a lady with paranoid schizophrenia, learning disabilities and 5% intelligence. In just under two years, she passed a driving test. She's got basic maths and English from Chesterfield College. She comes out doing the Maastricht interview and she's got her own business making recovery jewellery. The interesting thing, the other voice called Holly, who she thought was a sister comment on her appearance, actually said to her one day, who are you? Because she couldn't recognise the changes within herself, this voice didn't actually know who she was. So it's a very, very powerful way of doing it. You can use it with voices if you're driving the paranoia, you can do it with any kind of traumatic experience. But you have to be aware of your own fears and traumas before working with another person's experience. A lot of people work in mental health for different reasons. If you have got your own issues, you need to deal with them because it's very easy to transfer onto someone else. Focus on the bits they don't want to see and ask them to explain in their own words. When Chris alluded to the infantism, that's when people are down here, emotionally, they're three and four. They haven't got the vocabulary to tell you what the person did was wrong. You can't just dismiss that. You've got to be creative. You can use paint, you can use clay, anything which would describe a rich, what we've seen as a rich fantasy world. What do you do when you work with people that hear voices and you ask them a question, they don't answer? You ask them another question, they don't answer. You ask them a third question, they don't answer. Do we end the session? No, we need to know why they won't answer. I do this with many, many of my clients. I will write a question down. Are your voices telling you not to speak to me? Tick yes or no, and I push it across the table. Yes. Is it someone you know? Tick yes or no. Yes. Are you afraid of them? Yes. And we do this for one hour. The thing is, you're empowering that person to get a way around working with, not being, stopping the voices from being able to work. That's the important thing. You've got to invest time. And it's about being creative for that person. A lady I was working with in Wodonga in Australia, what her father did to her, you would not have done in a concentration camp. And I also worked with her on Skype. She came on one, mo one morning and she says, I've got a real problem, Pete. There's something I need to tell you, but my dad's voice won't let me. And if I don't tell you, I don't think I can work with you anymore. So you're in danger of throwing 18 months of hard work away. So I said, leave it with me and I'll come back to you. What I then reflected on all the meetings we'd had, I'd asked her some very intimate questions. The dad had never interrupted. So what's the clue there? The dad can't hear me. So I went back on and says, Kelly, you know when I speak to you, can your dad hear me? No, I don't think so. You know that question, you want to tell me what he won't let you? Email it me. We'll find a way around it. She emailed me the question, we continue with the work, the dad's none the wiser. So you've got to be creative, you've got to find a way of keeping that engagement going. So what you need, you need to know the person's trauma is over. And your task is to convey this from, fact from you to them without parenting or re-traumatising. So a prerequisite on your part is to believe it yourself, at least to believe that this is the problem. Until that cognition starts again, that fog starts to lift. It releases the cognitive traction, this begins to produce painful memories. The person can see that they're 40 years old, not four years old. Very, very important. And remember, do not parent. Parents keep kids alive and adults insane. But the three most important questions you've got to ask some, it's been mentioned too many times today, how have you got here, what happened? The first question I ask anybody I work with, why are you in psychiatric care? I've got schizophrenia. No, 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 no. That's what someone's told you. Why do you think you're in psychiatric care? You might get a different answer or they might say, Quite often, I don't know then. I don't know. OK, you're saying you don't know. Who are you? Now, I don't want to know you Pete Bullymore, married twice with three kids, because that's what you've done. Tell me who you are. It's a big question. And I guarantee you, 95% of the people you ask will tell you that they don't know. So that's a clue that they started to use dissociation. Dissociation as a child is helpful. 
If you're dissociating an adult, adult about a child's problem, it is not unhelpful. Uh, sorry, it's unhelpful, it's not helpful. Because it's, it causes depersonalization and derealization of the self. You don't know who you are. The third most important question, what's your biggest fear? There may be many fears, what's your primary fear? When did that start? When I was 12. What was happening to you when you were 12? For you to deal with that as a 12 year old, you would have to dissociate. Have you dealt with that problem? No. What happens when someone reminds you about it or something? I dissociate. So you're continuing to depersonalize and dualize the self. We've got an idea of now why you might be in psychiatric service. It's not definite, but it gives us a starting point that we can start to explore with the person. It's three simple questions, but you can pull so much information out from the person. But I know I've got much time, so I just wanted to look at this because it's something we do miss with paranoia and it is important. The body state information. We always look on the psyche rather than whatever the body can create paranoia as well. Has anybody heard anybody talking about the little witch? Um, can be walking down the street and they think they see something out the corner of their eye. When they turn there's nothing there or it moves with them, looks like a little witch. A lot of people do mention it quite a lot. It's diabetes, lesions in the eyes. Long term use in neuroleptics, the diabetes rates are going up, you get lesions in the eyes, you see things that are not there and it creates paranoia. Anybody heard of the sex machine? Men and women turning an accident and emergency and saying, I can feel a vibrator whirring in my stomach, but I don't know how it's got there. Principal bowel syndrome, long term use of neuroleptics, you'll have stomach problems and people don't, are not aware of this. But this is the important one, the thought insertion. Chuck voices in with this and you can have some real problems. Ego dystonic intrusions, thoughts outside the personality. We're talking about automatic thoughts. Now there's only two ways that we think. Ego dystonic, which says these are not my thoughts, or ego syntonic, that says they are my thoughts. We don't think any other way. Now they're automatic thoughts, what we don't know is why we have them, but what we do know is we don't act on them, but it can be very frightening. I'll give you an example, I haven't got a flip chart so I'll have to do it this way. That's rabbit, rabbit one, okay, see rabbit one? And that's rabbit two, okay. Now rabbit one hops around the field all day and does not think about anything. Rabbit two thinks fox. Who's got the best chance of survival, one or two? Two. Why? What's he doing? What's, what's, what's he guarding himself against? Danger. Yeah, exactly. Danger. This is what automatic thoughts are doing, the ego dystonic. But if you don't understand them, they can be very, very frightening. I've got grandchildren. My grandson's eldest, he's called Sam, he's nine years of age. If he was walking down the stairs in front of me, and I have this ego dystonic thought that says, oh, if I kick Sam up the arse, I wonder how many times he'll bounce before he gets to the bottom of the stairs. I'd be alarmed. I love Sam, I don't want to hurt him, but they're showing me things I won't do. But if you're not aware of that and you chuck voicing, it could be very, very difficult. Let's just say, I just done to me in Denmark, let's say Chris is my therapist, and I come and see him, and we have an hour, and it goes fantastic, I really enjoy it. Oh, thanks Chris, I'll see you next week. I walk out of this building, I'm walking across the campus, I walk onto the street, and I see a girl about 14 years of age, and I have this ego dystonic thought that says, won't mind shagging her, I bet she's good in bed. <laughs> it's ego dystonic, it's not real. <laughs> but I would be horrified. I'm a grandfather. I don't have sex with kids. I'm not a paedophile. Then you perceive knowing glances. Then the voices come in. Sex case. Paedophile. Nonce. Oh, hang on a minute. No, 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 no. These are not my thoughts. I don't think this way. So now we're into thought insertion. Somebody's got to be thought, inserting these thoughts in my mind because I don't think this way. Who was the last person I saw? Sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Guy did it to me. In I work in a clinic in Denmark. He was really in my face. Similar, similar story. Called me all the dirty bastards under the sun. And I said, tell me what happened. And I, says, I, can't. I said, it wasn't me. I can't tell you why you have them, but I can reassure you you won't act on them. Very, very frightening for people. And I've said this to many people. I've had women come up to me at the end and say, that's reassured me. I've been driving down the road with my daughter in the car and I thought, I wonder what would happen if I throw her out? And I felt like a terrible mother. They're showing you things that you won't do. And there's also this the possessed. Peripheral, no, peripheral neuropathy. Don't alcohol abuse, it desensitises the feelings in the hands. So people are being, think they're being possessed. And the devil. Respiratory alkosis, loss of breath, taking in too much oxygen without breathing out, also known as lobstering. What happens is people take in too much oxygen, they don't breathe out and they collapse and they go stiff. 
it's different to neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is rare now, but it still happens. With neuroleptic malignant syndrome, it's an adverse reaction to antipsychotics. You collapse the same, but with that, all the fluids drain out your body. If you don't get the fluids in, the person dies. This is about deregulation of breathing. You get the person breathing, it goes away. But you'll see charlatans in South America. They might, they might see you in the audience and say, hey, sweetheart, I can see the devil in you. They'll get your heart to the front, but then they'll deliberately deregulate your breathing and drop you to the floor. Then they'll regulate your breathing, get you back up. If the devil's gone, you owe me 50 bucks. That's quite often what they do. But also, this, this sleep paralysis, intrude hallucinations. This can be, a lot of students experience this when they start to cram. What happens is, when we go to bed at night, we have something called sleep paralysis. You can't move as freely while you're asleep as when you're awake. Now, everybody in this world, without variance, whether you remember it or not, between three and four in the morning, your brain becomes active and your eyes open. You don't always remember it, but it does. Anybody got children? Am I asking children? Remember when we were in the cot? You think, you've got, you think you're crying? You get up, you go across to the sleep, between three and four in the morning, come back. Okay? It happens. Now what happens is, some people, they get in bed, get the sleep paralysis, then they have nightmares or night terrors, and their eyes open during it. Quite often they'll see what's been in that night terror in the bedroom, or they might describe it as a black figure. It will come across and it will hold them down. But because of the sleep paralysis, they can't move or fight it off. So quite often people will think they've been violated. They'll get up and get in the shower afterwards. It's a classic sign that you're either going through a stressful time at that point or something else is manifesting from the past that's starting to resonate with you. I was talking about this in Australia last year and there was a guy who was very honest with me. He came up to me at the end, he says, if I'd have known that, that would have saved my marriage. His wife was raped by her father and she fell pregnant and she had to have an abortion. And when he married her, he says, it will never happen again. I promise you, I will always keep you safe. She had this night terror and this intruder hallucination the whole hallucination was her father on top of her having sex again. But because of the sleep paralysis, she couldn't wake her husband up. And it was so real to her, the next morning she says, you've let me down. My dad raped me last night. She left him, she left him, she took the kids, left him next day, she'd never seen him since. He said, I couldn't give her an explanation because I didn't know what was happening. He says, but if I'd known, I could have explained, there's nothing I could do, there's nothing that you can do. But also, this is a prosopagnosia, face blindness. It's rare, but you have to be aware of it. There was twin girls a couple of years ago, 13 years of age in England, developed face blindness. The only people they could recognise were each other. Couldn't recognise anyone else. But also, there was a guy in Wales, and he developed face blindness. Only in a small community, a small village. He could remember everyone except his sheep. I made a joke about that in Wales, that did not go down very well. <laughs> So when he was walking through the street, people were speaking to him, but he didn't know them. Why are these strangers speaking to me? So he just ignored them. But then all the family got known as being ignorant and got victimised. They had to leave the village. The rare it is, but you have to be aware that these things are, that are, they are out there. So the important points for working with a person's fear and paranoia are the person must want help. That's the important thing. The second one is trust. Professionals assume trust, but you cannot do that. Imagine your worst anxiety, multiply it by 10, and you have an insight to how a consumer might feel. And three is aspects of trust. Show the person that you're not frightened of their fear, understand their anger, anger who are they really angry with? That's important. Look, listen, you're getting angry with me, who are you really angry with? And infantism. They continue to use infantile emotions and strategies. Quite often you say to people, okay, uh, do you... You know, are you, do you think you need your parents? No, but you can tell that they do. Little thing is, I'll sit with them, I'll say, okay, you know in 30 seconds time, that roof's gonna fall in. If it fell in 30 seconds time, where would you run to? My mom. No, 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 get out the fucking door, she's gonna die. You don't need your mom to keep you safe, because then you've got an idea that they think they need the mom to be safe. Security, provide security in later life that wasn't there through trauma. Look at a person's current defence, not infant defence, and kickstart their, kick their rational cognition. And six is rational thought. Fear stops rational thought. People use drinking drugs to remove mental pain. I explain that the mental pain is out of date, you're an adult. Seven is fogging. A person will use fogging as they see it's too dangerous, they're focusing on the most fearful. Like we looked at those boxes, you would not start with Bob. 
We never know where we're going to stop, but we know that's the landmark. We're going to leave it. You might say, hey, what about talking about granddad? No, I'll talk about my dog. You've got your starting point. That's the important thing. And lots of boxes. Grow through the layers with their consent at the rate at which they go through them. Identify the less problematic and most difficult. Try to get rid of all the boxes because they need to become an adult and create a bond of support. Benign is avoidance. The person they won't talk about or identify is the person they most fear. And ten is changing power. If the abuser is still bigger, change the infantism. They're still addressing a child's fear. Eleven is abandoned. Children abused by a third party are often confused as to where the parental role was. And again, we have to be very clear about this. When we this, I have to go through some very difficult things with people I work with. Listen, I am not blaming your parents. I'm a parent. I'm sure I've made many mistakes, but we are entitled to be angry. There's a difference between blame and anger. That's the important thing. So, oh, could I, 30 seconds to go. Can I just say thank you? It's been absolutely amazing to, to work with you. Thank you for giving me your time. I always enjoy coming to Dublin. And thank you for Mary and everybody for inviting us. If anybody wants these slides, oh, you've got them anyway, haven't you? Yeah. You, can, you can have the slides. Any follow, other follow-on information, please drop me an email. If it has raised anything for anyone, come and have a conversation. Don't, don't take it home with you because it is heavy stuff. And just finally to say, I'm just going to finish with this. It's, fine. it's an important thing about talking to people. It's a true story about a guy called George. He was in an old asylum for years and no one bothered with him. Then Thorazine was introduced, chlorpromazine, supposed to revolutionise the prognosis of schizophrenia. George was selected for the drugs trials. This is the effect it had on George's life. None have paid George any attention for years. Now doctors, attendants and nurses all talked to him and watched eagerly to see what effect the drug would have. His condition improved rapidly. After only two weeks of the drug treatment, he was moved to a ward for less disturbed patients where he took part in a number of activities. Soon he was doing so well, he was promoted again. By this time, he had lively relationships with other patients and many members of staff. He began to spend several hours a day with paints and clay. He was then to express the rich fancy life that had previously interested no one. His doctors marvelled, attendants praised his skill. George was released from hospital 38 days after his first dose of Thorazine. Whilst he was signing out, he remembered he left something behind, went back to his room and returned with an old sock. The puzzled attendant who asked to see it found 38 Thorazine pills carefully stashed inside the sock. I think that's a fantastic story. People have taken an interest in him. But I think there's a sad element. What if he'd never been selected for the trials? And it's interesting, uh, just to finish up, uh, we, we should never give up on people regardless of age. There's a lady in America, and uh, she does a lot of work with people using a Maastricht interview. She worked with a lady, 73 years of age, and she said, can I do the Maastricht interview with you? Sorry, 76 years of age. Can I do the Maastricht interview with you? What is it? It's, well, I want to know your narrative. The first question is, how many voices do you hear? She burst into floods of tears. Said, I'm very sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. She says, you haven't. I've waited 60 years for somebody to ask me that question. And there's a lady in Orange in New South Wales in Australia, 93 years of age, just gone through the Maastricht interview for Thoughts, Beliefs and Paranoia, totally revolutionised her life. And you say, what a, what, what a fantastic outcome, but what a shame. It's had to take all those years. So never give up on people. People want to be asked. All the research shows everybody wants to be asked. Not everybody wants to disclose. But 12 months later, when you've gained the trust, you might say, I'm happy to talk to you now. We don't always have to do them. We just want people to believe us and not blame us. That's the important thing. So again, thank you very much once again. And the final word from me is, that's all, folks. Thank you very much. <laughs>
see that there's a problem with that and, and is there anything we can do? Yeah, it's not about, it's not about attacking the beliefs or changing the beliefs because if they've got that belief system, it means something for them. Yeah. But if it's affecting their quality of life, work on their quality of life. Mm -hmm. So actually the belief system then might become secondary, but they still hold it. That's, that's the important thing. We're not trying to take it away. We're yeah. trying to make it, hang on, this is your quality of life. Let's forget that, that's yours. Yeah. What else would you like to do with your life rather than just focusing on these beliefs? I think that's the, impo yeah, that's yeah. the important thing. Cause, and it's about understanding when they invite you in. I'm supervising a lady in Indiana and she sent me an email. She's working with this guy who's quite paranoid. And she, she, she said, I think I've made a, a really big mistake. Because this guy had said to her, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to see my world. And she did, she closed her eyes. And then she said to him, I'm very sorry, I can't see it. And he ended the session and he left. And she says, I think I've let him down. I said, no, you've not let him down. You've been honest. Don't invent a world that's not his because you'll get lost. But he's, done you, he's, he's telling you something, he trusts you. He's inviting you into his world. So what you could have said to him is, I'm sorry I can't see your world. What did you want me to see? And then he tells you what it is and you know the framework that he's working in. And then beyond that, you can look at what you can actually yeah. establish within his life to make that easier. Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes about working on the quality of life yeah. and then they will invite you in. Yeah. You've brought up an, an interesting issue there is the issue of clinical supervision. And I think that's something that we don't necessarily have access to um, in mainstream mental health mm. nursing. Um, that's mm. something we need, need to be yeah. thinking about. Um, Peace, can I ask you, have you done, have you, have you done any work or um, um, background about, you know Adlerian psychology and social interests and Alfred Adler always talked about, um, it's all about beliefs which is fed the meaning, but he brought in the purpose. What's the purpose attached to the meaning yeah. that provides the lifestyle? Uh, I've, I've, I'll be honest with you, I haven't read the word that you, that you yeah. talk, I haven't read the word, so I, I'd, be, I'd be making an answer up which is not yeah. really. Yeah. Because that, that sort of coincided with Bob Johnson as well yeah. and where sort of he comes from, sort of that balance beliefs mean. Yeah, it's what do what the beliefs mean to the person yeah. rather than making an assumption about what it believes. My beliefs are my beliefs and that's like not going to promote on other people. That's why, like I was saying, you know, what, I don't share your beliefs, but what do they mean to you? Exactly. That's, and I, then I understand. I'm not exactly. taking them away because I saw a DVD. I'll not name this person because it's not fair. And he, and he thinks this was the right approach. It's on YouTube. Got this guy comes into his clinic and he's very, very, what he called delusional. I don't think this guy was because it really is meant, very elaborate belief system. Yeah. And this therapist said, well, I believe you believe it. Well, at that point, I would have walked out because you've just told me you don't believe me. Mm -hmm. So language and how we frame it and soften it is very, very important. Mm -hmm. It's like you think about, it's a problem we have belief, modif belief modification techniques. They're nonsense. Mm -hmm. You're not going to modify my beliefs. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, and don't use the word delusion because it tells you I don't believe you. If you went to work somewhere and you were victimised because your race, age, gender, whatever it was, and every time you told your line manager they didn't believe you, after a period of time, how would that make you feel? Mm -hmm. Angry, sad, upset, depressed? This is what we do when we tell people that it's a delusion. Mm -hmm. It's got a meaning and a purpose to them. They might not always make sense of it at that point, yeah. but if we understand the narrative, there's a seed of truth in there. Mm -hmm. like, like with Thomas, all the CIA were after him. No, the problem was... Nobody listened to him when his dad was beating him. Have you any suggestions for a couple of second year nurses here who are going to be become psychiatric nurses in a couple of years and going out into wards and all that? Like how, when you hear all this type of view on what schizophrenia, paranoia, and all that, and like we're going to be going into a system where it's totally fighting against this, like how? Of course. How? Any suggestions? Like I, I honestly am buying into what you're saying. I'm totally buying into what Jackie Dillon believes and, and yeah. all that. But as a, as a nurse on a ward in any Q unit, yeah, it's the same how, in England. How are we supposed to? Yeah, it's, it's the same in England. And uh, but the thing is, it's about being. Let's be honest. When you qualify, you've got no power. That, that's we're going to be really honest. You're going to go into work. You, you have got no power. And, and it's not about you, and it's not about the staff. It's about the infrastructure that they want you to actually try and work within. That's the difference balance. This is why you need collaboration. We can't change from the outside. We need people like you to help from change from the inside. Now, it's, it's small increments of change lead to large increments of change. Let's just say we're talking about hearing voices. If you read the Maastricht interview, he came on the train, you'd be able to implement this so easily. Because some workers will say, I've got 40 clients, Pete. How can I do this? Well, how long do you get with them? An hour. All right, take, call it 30 minutes because you've got to travel. Okay, if you're a CPN. What do you do in that 30 minutes? Talk about the local derby at football. 
Why can you not just say to someone, chat, sat in their front room or in a, in a room on the ward, do you mind me asking, how many voices do you hear? <coughs> do you think they're part of you? Where are they lo located? Can anyone else hear them? Can you communicate with them? You've just done the first section of Maastricht, and all you do is being curious. Mm. And then you just constantly do little changes, and then when that person starts to improve, they might say, what have you been doing with Tony? Asking him questions. That's not against the nursing guidelines. <laughs> Nurses are trained to ask questions. So it's how you implement it, looking at small increment to get to large increment, that's the important thing. But it's a difficult task, but while well, if you keep that mindset, it, it's important. Yeah, it's not this isn't even talked about, it's not no. happening, it's not. It's only slowly getting through in England. I mean, England's not a panacea, believe you me. We're slowly getting it through and we've actually got trust putting money into it now. But it's took a long time and we've had to get, we, we've had to get psychiatrists on board and some other disciplines and get them on the training. That's, that's the important bit. Be that curious. That. I mean, there's, of there's course. Research, I'm, I'm a service user trainer uh, for yeah. one of the universities and I, I work there from experience, and they, they can't poo-poo that. They can't, because That's right. you, you can't debate it, you can't argue it, because yeah. you're speaking from a path and a, a system of strength and recovery, and they yeah. have to listen to it. That's right. And actually, the students mm -hmm. want to embrace it. They do, but beyond that, his role, when he gets into the wards, you need to get somebody with, with power to help him make those changes. Game changes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think, believe in, believe in what you're doing, I think. Yeah. And I think one, one quick point, we live in the information age as well, and like thanks to social media, so they play a really important point, yeah. part of liberating people, you know, so... Uh, yeah. And I think, to me, is it's about looking beyond diagnose. I wouldn't diagnose anyone, to be honest with you because human beings are too diverse, but every time somebody sits in front of me and they're very, very distressed at times, I think, what if that was my son or daughter, mm. or my mum and dad, or uh, brothers? But what would you, would you do to them, different to what you'd do your son or daughter? Put them in that position and say, I'm not going to deliver a service I want to have for myself, so what can I do to make those changes? It's about personalising it, that's, that's yeah. input, because it could just, be... Can I just say, though, in terms of, you know, its presence mm. or awareness in the mental health services, you're right to a certain degree that there's a, there are many services where this is viewed as witchcraft, you know. But <laughs> on, on the other hand, <laughs> there are services who have hearing voices groups oh, yeah. in, the, in, in their acute yeah. units whose staff have come to the training, who have set up groups oh. in the community. Yeah. And, you know, so it, we, we, we have people who come to the groups who say their, their psychiatrist sent them, you know, mm. told them about it or whatever. So mm. that's a very different picture than it would have been three or yeah. four years ago yeah. when we were yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. You can start a group. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. Something that, yeah. something that might be helpful, I don't know how this is going to pan out, but it's just something that's happening within Dublin. Um, earlier on this year, I came and did some work for Jessica Stewart, and if anybody knows Jessica, HSI and things like that. We train people on the Maastricht approach for voices. We've been, we've been twice now. But in July, we're doing the days beyond the construct, what we can do with this information. Well, on the first session, there was, a, there was a guy called Charlie Bannon, if anybody knows Charlie, and he's really switched on and he's passionate about this. And he's, we're going to have a meeting in the evening in July about people that want to enforce these changes. And he's got some quite, you know, from, from what I can gather, influential people coming along. Then what he wants to do is arrange a public meeting within Dublin. He's already talking to some service. You'll know him better than what I do. But we've got a psychiatrist coming over from England that supports this and helped to set up the first Maastricht Approach Centre. We've got the chief exec that bought it in for London and Derby coming across. And he's going to bring this public meeting. He's wanting higher, higher echelon people to come along and say, listen to what they've got to say, then tell us why we cannot have it. 
So it should be a very healthy debate. So I can keep you posted on, on that. Put it on the website. Yeah. So uh, as long, sorry. No, I just want to say, have have hope, have optimism. Yeah. Uh, we're light years away, aren't we, Mick? From uh, you know, uh, 2003. You know, unbelievable. When we did the training at St Canisters. This is like I tell you, you're, you're on the verge of some great stuff here in Ireland, obviously. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, I'm going to close by just thanking so much, Peter, for all his work. Thank you.